Welcome to Good Game, I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. Today on the show, we have a few games that require some strategy and a cunning plan. Yes, but often those plans go straight out the window, as we see in the monster hunting madness of Evolve. Shoes about to fire! Also this week, all the strategy in the world can't save the Roman Empire in the latest total war, Attila. Plus, Goose accesses his RAM in a new memory cache. But before all that, can you name the game for this week? What makes human, human? What defines consciousness or the soul? What is our purpose? If a tree falls in the woods, was it really a tree? What? Mm, exactly. We ponder life in the Talos Principle. We see the world as a mystery, a puzzle, because we've always been a species of problem solvers. The Talos Principle is a first-person puzzle game that's been widely compared to Portal, although the more I played, the more differences I found. But I think we can put our differences behind us. You are cast as the newly activated humanoid robot, tasked by the disembodied voice of Elohim with collecting sigils on your path to enlightenment. It is your purpose to seek these sigils, for thus you will serve the generations to come and attain eternal life. It starts out very serene, but also quite exciting. I mean, you're a new creation with an entire world made just for you. But cracks quickly begin to form. Painted messages speak of doubt and mistrust. Your surroundings occasionally buzz and flicker like a hologram glitch. And the library system is filled with eerie existentialist messages. And most importantly, there's an ominous tower which you've been strictly instructed not to climb. Yes, it's all very mysterious, isn't it? And I really liked the way that mystery unfurled. And can I just say, visually, this game is beautiful. Forests and gentle snowfall, burning deserts, ah, and castles. That cathedral was my favourite. And the lens flare. Oh. The game allows you to pick the order of puzzles with three hubs containing numbered doorways. Through the doors are smallish maps with a few puzzles. Complete them and you'll get a Tetronimo sigil, which gives you access to later levels and equipment. There is much that you may learn in the halls of my temples, for there is much that you do not know. I more or less played in order, but I found the difficulty was all over the place. I'd go from completing three or four puzzles easily, first time, to spending half an hour on one, just pulling my hair out. only then to follow it up with a few more easy ones. One could say that the existentialist questions are the real puzzles of the game. No, it's the puzzles. The puzzles are right there. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Still, something kept pulling me back in. I just get so irritated with the puzzle and walk away, only to come back in an hour desperate to finish it. If this trial seems impossible to overcome, have no fear. Return another time and the answer may reveal itself. I mean, I'd almost argue that the lack of hand-holding kind of mimics the idea of being a new creation, exploring a new world and then just trying to find meaning in that. Yeah, maybe. I still think it's a bit of a cop-out, though. Yeah, I don't know. I think it adds context. And I liked the character of the game, the fact that it's always reminding you that nothing you see around you is real. You're a robot, but you feel like a human. But what makes us human? Just that human versus AI concept, I find that really interesting. I did enjoy arguing morals and consciousness with the library and channeling my inner robot. But dialogue options are ultimately limited and designed to make you contradict yourself by ignoring circumstances and grey areas. And then about two thirds of the way through, I just stopped having fun with the puzzles. I think they became tedious and unfair. Like when I was up to the last door and then I accidentally stood in the way of a laser beam and it locked me out with all my tools on the other side. Unlike the last of five doors, never has a reset been so sad. Oh, Bajo. Well, I had fun with those lasers, just trying to get all the angles just right. I, I think that was probably my favorite puzzle element. Yeah, I like that too, when I wasn't being locked out. And part of my frustration was just from impatience. I wanted to go up that tower. And the other part was because a lot of the solving just felt like busy work. We are the story, and the story tells us who we are. 
I quite liked squirreling away all the parts and methodically trying all of them, but you're right, after a while the solutions just got tired and were either too silly or too obvious. And some puzzles are essentially repeats, which makes it feel like they just ran out of ideas. And then sometimes there'd be something included like a fan that's completely irrelevant to solving the puzzle. Apparently the game is full of Easter eggs, so maybe they're a part of that. They still felt like red herrings, though. Yeah, well, overall I think they've been quite ambitious and unique with their approach, especially with regards to the story, which I definitely appreciated. I mean, sure, maybe the attempts at highbrow debate sometimes fell flat, but I thought it was great how they managed to weave in questions of humanism, purpose, faith and existentialism. Plus, there were quite a few moments that I felt genuinely moved, and that's worth something, I think. Yeah, it's just a shame that the endings aren't that great. I've played through two out of three of them, and you just see them coming a mile off. So, unfortunately for me, this is predominantly a puzzle game, and the puzzles aren't that well polished, so that's a problem. I disagree. I quite liked the puzzles and I thought the themes were really innovative. Well, I'm going to give it two stars. It's three and a half from me. It's not a comforting way of thinking about the world, but I'd rather face the truth than lie to myself. And now here is Mr Goose with the news. <laughs> Bioware Austin has announced it has ceased development on their online RPG Shadow Realms. The studio's general manager Jeff Hickman didn't provide any specific reason for the game's cancellation, except to say that there are other projects within Bioware that need to be worked on. Their main focus will now be on expanding Star Wars The Old Republic, as well as assisting with further Dragon Age Inquisition DLC and the new Mass Effect. Legal representatives from Fallout 3 publisher Bethesda Softworks have issued a cease and desist letter to indie studio Xreal, demanding they change the name of their game Fortress Fallout due to the use of the word Fallout. Xreal has agreed to change the name of the game to avoid any costly legal battle with the publisher, and has turned to the online community to help find a new name. Perhaps Fortress Doom, Fortress Wolfenstein, Fortress Scrolls, you can have those for free. <clears throat> the United States trademark for Sony's never-endingly in-development project The Last Guardian has been abandoned. The United States Patent and Trademark Office sent Sony a notice last year informing them the trademark needed to be extended, but after failing to do so, the trademark was cancelled. Sony has since confirmed that the game is still in development. And now over to eSports. Australian Counter-Strike GO team Vox Emina qualified for the ESL 1 Katowice Championship in Poland. Vox Emina took down Danish heavyweights Dignitas 16 games to 13 in the qualifiers, earning themselves a spot in the finals to be held in March. 16-13 and look at that celebration. But back on home soil, the Aussies continued to dominate, with three Australian teams qualifying for the Global Call of Duty Championships. Exile 5, T1, Integral Nation and Plantronics Mind Freak, formerly Team Immunity, came in as the top three teams at the Asia-Pacific Regional Final held in Sydney. They will all now move on to compete in Los Angeles in March, amongst 32 other teams battling it out for a prize pool of $1 million. And that's all for this week. Thanks, Goose. It's the dawn of the Dark Ages. The hordes are at the gate, and the sun is well and truly setting on the Roman Empire. It's total war, Attila. The Total War series continues its march through history, and this time Attila and his hordes of Huns are the cover boys. I have to admit, Bajo, that while I'd obviously heard of Attila the Hun, I didn't know a whole lot about who he was and what he did exactly, so I was quite excited to jump into this and find out about what this period history was all about. Yeah, the Total War games are pretty good history teachers, actually. <laughs> if you've never played one in the series, it's basically a mash of turn-based and real-time strategy. There's a huge campaign map where you manage your empire and plan out your grand ambition. And when armies clash, you can go down onto the field to direct thousands of troops in battle. Total War games are always scrappy affairs. You start off with all your units in neat little rows, hoping your brave soldiers will hold the line till the very end. But before long, those lines start to crumble under the weight of flanking cavalry, raining arrows, and a thousand swords clashing. 
it's all about positioning, isn't it? Holding the high ground or pulling off some clever flanking maneuvers makes all the difference. I mean, to the point where a well-placed and cleverly commanded force can even take on armies well over twice their size. I love those moments, Hex, where you think you have no chance, but then some smart decisions and maybe a bit of luck, and you can manage to pull off a win. The enemy are broken. They turn and run. They're just such great fist pump moments. Yeah, but then so much rides on just making sure your men don't freak out and run away, doesn't it? Morale is a huge factor in any battle, since your men will only fight as long as their morale holds out. As they suffer losses, get flanked, or find their general has been slaughtered, they start to crack and eventually give up. Their general is dead! It's just so frustrating sometimes when you watch your men turn tail and run. Just stand and fight to the last man, you cowards! We're the men are given up and are running for their lives! This is a shameful display. All up, I think this is some of the best action that we've seen from the series. It's just got that scissors, paper, rock strategy that still works so well, where melee beats spears, spear beats cavalry, cavalry beat melee, while those archers and artillery just rain down pain until you take care of them. And they haven't messed with that formula too much. It's just a few little tweaks that help it all flow a bit better. Units now take longer for their morale to break, giving you valuable seconds to evaluate the situation and implement new strategies. Units are now also more likely to regain their composure and be ready to charge back into battle so things don't tend to fall apart so quickly. Our men are rallying! They're not done yet! The AI also feels more responsive and willing to push their advantage. Give them an opening and they'll take it. I also like that the siege battles aren't just capture the flag affairs now. Previously, if you could get into the town centre and hold it, you'd score an automatic victory. So one rogue unit could sneak around the side, get him behind the battle lines and win the day. But now holding the town centre just gives you a big morale boost, which is still important, but at least it's not an auto-fail if it falls into enemy hands. So ultimately, all these tweaks add up to make a noticeable difference. Naval battles are back too, but they're still not much fun in my opinion. I've never really figured out how to use any sense of strategy to win on the high seas other than through sheer force of numbers. Our ship is being assaulted! Cast them back! Yeah, naval battles for me just go straight to the auto-resolve button. Of course, there have been a few changes in the campaign map too. The biggest is that this time you can play as a horde faction such as the Huns. Now, they're actually a returning feature from the Barbarian Invasion expansion from the first Rome Total War. They're such a welcome return, aren't they? The hordes really force you to change up your tactics. In a horde, each army basically doubles as a mobile city, carrying their buildings and civilization around with them. They can make camp anywhere for a few turns to improve their buildings and catch their breath, or they can capture a city and settle down to become a more traditional civilization. But then they can quickly pack up their things and get back on the move. Although your horde seems to lose all of the building upgrades you've made and then returns to square one if you settle down and then pick back up again, which seems like a huge penalty. Yeah, I can see why they've done it though. They don't want settling down to be a small decision. You have to be serious about it. I, I also never really figured out how to use the hordes effectively, but I did quite enjoy rampaging the land and flattening cities trying to figure that out. Politics and family disputes now play a bigger part with random political events cropping up, and how you deal with them can mean the difference between having a united empire or starting a civil war. I was just guessing which course of action to take with those. Yeah, well, I guess they're trying to make it so that there is no right answer. I mean, every action will have some sort of reaction, so you kind of just have to go with your gut. Hmm, and that's fair enough, I think. There's also now an element of climate change that goes on throughout the campaigns. As the northern climates become colder, reducing the productivity and worth of northern regions. Which I thought was a nice way to mix up the endgame. Yeah, that said though, and I hate to say this, even though I do think this is one of the best Total War games there have been, this is the ninth game in the series and I'm starting to find them a bit samey. I'm just... I'm really starting to burn out on these. I don't know, I think they're onto a, a good formula, and especially with strategy games, it's quite difficult to reinvent that kind of game with each release. Yeah, and the real-time battles are still really thrilling, but the campaigns are just becoming a bit of a grind. Yeah, they are a bit exhausting. You can almost never afford to have anywhere near as many troops as you'd like, and you're always finding yourself struggling to keep everything together. Yeah, they're really tough. You know, I'm always saving up to everything I do in this game because I know that the slightest wrong move can and will come back to bite me. I still really enjoy the challenge, though. I like having these campaigns just burning away in the background. You know, you wait for a, a lonely night where you load it up, destroy a civilization or two, and then put it away for a while. 
The enemy are broken. They turn and run. Yeah, there is no denying this is quality strategy and one of the best entries into the franchise. I'm going to give it four out of five stars. It's three stars from me. The general is dead. A lethal blow. Some of my greatest gaming discoveries were thanks to the once revered but now redundant demo disc found attached to video game magazines. And one of my all time favourite discoveries was Little Big Adventure 2 Twinson's Odyssey. This was a 3D adventure game for the PC from French developers Adeline Software and the follow up to the original Little Big Adventure, also known as Relentless. In it, you played as Twinson, hero of the planet Twin Sun, already a little confusing, which has been invaded by some suspicious aliens that are kidnapping the planet's children and wizards. Along with uncovering this dastardly plot, you also had to heal your pet dragon, uh, train as a wizard yourself, uh, speak with some of the local rabbit, elephant and mosquito people, visit an off-world casino and defeat enemies with your magical ball. Yeah, it was a bit weird. But I feel like that's what drew me to the game in the first place. There was a liberating amount of wackiness to LBA2 that I feel is missing in a lot of today's games. Almost like no idea was off limits, each location, character and storyline abounded with lovely surreal storybook-like qualities and strange art design that could have only come from a French developer. You just acquired a superb Nitro Mecha Penguin. One of the weirdest elements, perhaps, was an obtuse control system that involved switching between four distinctive behaviour types. Normal, sporty, aggressive and discreet. And while it was great to have such a variety of movement and actions at your disposal, having to constantly swap between modes, often mid-action, felt absurdly clunky and unnecessary even 18 years ago. The camera also required constant resetting, which made platforming sections particularly frustrating due to strange perspectives and awkward angles. Luckily, the rest of the game was just so darn charming that all these issues were easily forgiven. Characters had detailed animations that played out as if they had lives beyond your involvement. Side quests and mini-games rivaled the Zelda series for creativeness and fun, and the story was just so bizarrely dreamlike that it mesmerised me like no game I'd played before. In fact, I probably racked up more hours in the demo of this game than in the full version. And this was because the demo actually allowed you to fully explore the main island while randomly transporting you to future sections of the game via regular doorways. Which gave younger me the idea that if I explored thoroughly enough, I could actually find the full game hidden within the demo somewhere. What an idiot. <laughs> So you can then imagine my wonder and delight when I finally saved up enough to buy the full version of the game, which included full CD quality voice acting, hello, away off the island, and doors that actually connected to their corresponding structures. Amazing. Thanks, Mr. Goose. Cooperative games are fun. Teaming up with friends to take down giant monsters is a rewarding experience for everyone involved. But put a human brain inside one of those monsters and the game changes. This is Evolve. Look at them Rebus. I feel like the team is relying on me to find him. <laughs> went through the swamp this way. I got him. Yes, I got him! God, I need help. <laughs> oh, he got me! Delete the Kraken. That's gonna hurt. Evolve is a human versus monster game. It's brought to us by Turtle Rock Studios, creators of Left 4 Dead, which was a game that took a simple idea of zombies versus humans and created something that transcended your average co-op shooter. So I guess the real question is, can they do it again with Evolve? Let's go murder this rare and endangered wildlife for money. The basic idea is to throw four humans into a monster's world for a high stakes game of cat and mouse. The monster grows in strength as the match goes on by eating wildlife. It can evolve twice into a more powerful beast if it has time and can evade its pursuers. In the standard game mode Hunt, a stage 3 monster can then turn the tables on the hunters by attacking the power relay. 
forcing the hunters into a defensive position. Now things are somewhat more difficult. Hex, when you first jump in, it's just chaos, isn't it? As you try and figure out what you have to do and where to go. You really do feel like a rookie, don't you? Yeah, a paranoid rookie, where any <laughs> flicker in the shadows can mean instant death. Help me! Oh. I just love how stressed everyone is as they desperately try and hold the team together, barking orders left and right. It's great. Yeah, I think half the game is communication and trying not to get too worked up with the arguments that you have with your friends. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm so gone. Oh, no. Glove we'll reviving. I'm trying. I'll yeah, get you. I'll push you up. And uh, someone help me. Where are you coming? Stop it, you stupid help. frog! Help. I had a toad issue. Uh, it's over. Oh, this isn't going well. We had him. We probably needed our assault before this all began. This is true. I didn't think about that. <laughs> And that's the biggest strength of the game, I think. You're always learning how to do better by how badly you've done before. Man, we did no damage to him. In stage one, we should have killed him. When those weak spots are up, I think we've all just got to go for it. Well, let's talk about the Hunters first. There are four classes, and each of these have three characters to play, which you unlock as you go. From what we've unlocked so far, it's clear that each character class has quite different weapons and play styles to go with them. The Assault is your damage dealer, the Trapper relies on gadgets such as anchors. Arena's up. Oh, where is he? He's here. You're not getting away, buddy. Where are you going? And can pop a mobile arena dome, which, if used at just the right time, can force the monster into a fight. Where are you going? Where are you going? Nowhere! Support is second in line for damage, can shield allies for backup protection, or drop an orbital barrage. Oh, that's gonna hurt. No. Oh. And finally, there's the Medic, who makes use of the all-important tranquilizers to slow the monster, Got it. heals teammates, ready. and can puncture the monster for weak spots. And as we mentioned, all four classes have extra characters to unlock, which drastically alter your playstyle. Yeah, I especially like the robot Bucket, who can send off his head for a bit of recon. Now to see what trouble. we can see. Do you grow a new head, or does it, like, teleport back? I or? don't know. And there is a lot of recon to do. You're always chasing the monster, following its tracks, keeping the map up to try and predict where it's going to go next and cut it off at the pass. What well, as a hunter should be doing. Indeed. OK, I reckon he's going to go up and then left. I got him. Shoot her! Oh, die, die, die. I also like how you always have to be aware of what's happening. You can't slack off for a second. You really need to know what your teammates are doing at all times so that no one gets stuck in wildlife or gets ambushed. Oh, monster in the water, monster in the water, watch out. And the fights, Bajo, they're so frantic, especially if the monster catches you off guard. This is one of those games that's really frustrating to play with people who don't know what they're doing, of which there are many of online. There's also a little bit of trial and error with mixing up the classes, but I think that's part of the fun. There's also lots of switching between targets in a fight. From the hunters to the monster, back to the hunters, all the switching back and forth, and I really like that. It's really focused on utilising your specific role within the group. Yeah, and the pressure is always on too, because the longer you take to track it down, the more risk you have of it evolving and getting more powerful. There are lots of cues to alert you to the monster's location though, such as scared birds and audio markers. Monster scared some birds! Leave the birds alone. Plus the roar of the monster itself if it evolves. He's down here. Once again, though, charging into where you think the monster might be might seem like a good idea, but you could be walking into a trap. Over here. Come on! Easy. Run. Run. There's a trap. Where is he? Ah. Let's talk about the monsters. There are three with the standard edition of the game. The Goliath is kind of like a warrior. It leaps about the land, breathing fire. I love its victory scream hex. That tongue. <laughs> There's also the Kraken, which is more like a mage. It flies about hurling electricity and waves to knock enemies over. And the Wraith, who is more like a rogue and the scariest of the three by far. When playing as a monster, you have quite a few choices available to you at the start of a round. Do you feed and evolve as fast as possible? Or rush in and try and catch the team off guard? Or maybe play a stealth game? The monster can hide quite well in this world full of other giant beasties. These maps feel like the monster's turf, like it grew up on this planet as the alpha predator. Feeding on these creatures also fills a secondary health bar or armor bar. 
It's usually a good idea to lure hunters into a trap when your armor is full. The biggest surprise for me, Hex, was that the monster was super fun to play, maybe even more fun than the humans. I often find in games like this, whenever there's a different type of creature that you're controlling, like a zombie or a beast, the controls and the unfamiliarity of how that monster works ultimately makes them not as much fun to play as the humans. But not in this case. Yeah, it's so rewarding when you're dominating in a fight. You really do feel like a monster just grabbing at these humans. Ah, oh, take it. Yeah, and location is really important too. I mean, there's some areas that are much better to fight in when you're playing as the monster, but some as humans. I mean, you want to do the confrontation on your own terms and probably not in a small room. He's got time for that, kind of. The game encourages you to plan out attacks and yet always adapt to the situation at hand. He's in now, he's trapped in. Dropping into a fight is pretty exciting, and the drop-in drop-out system works really well with bots taking over players if they leave or get disconnected. The bots aren't great though, are they? They're slightly <laughs> better than nothing. Still, I'm glad they're there. I also quite like the second mode, evacuation. Can anyone help? We were attacked. This is a longer match set over various days where the wins and losses of one round will affect who has an advantage on the next. And this comes in the form of things like turrets and those nasty plants on the ground that like to munch on you. I always go back to Hunt though. Yeah, Hunt is just more fun, I think, and it just feels more refined and competitive. But I do like how evacuation forces monsters and humans to rethink their current situation and refocus priorities. There's just so much that's great about Evolve, and I'm surprised at how much more we find to talk about as we play. Absolutely, and it's just a shame that it's all tainted a little by its high price, especially on PC. I know there are other online retailers that can do it better, but direct from Steam, it's a whopping $79.99 US. So for us Australians right now, that's about a hundred bucks. And if you want the DLC on top of that, let me just go cash in some war bonds, Hex. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I mean, the console version is a little bit cheaper at around $80 Australian, but still, this feels like it should be more like the $50 to $60 mark. It's a tough one, isn't it? Because I want my multiplayer shooters to have this much polish, but I don't want to have to go get a second mortgage on my scooter to be able to afford it. <laughs> well, I mean, similar to other multiplayer focused games like Titanfall, it's just a little light on content for the asking price. Can you mortgage a scooter? I guess if you're living in it. I mean, if you did, no. <laughs> I have completely drained and replaced my lubricants. Still, you won't be disappointed with the actual game, and most importantly, it feels balanced, which is no easy task when one of the playable characters is a giant mutating monster. Yeah, absolutely. Those fights get right down to the wire, don't they? And that's a good sign. What are you giving it, Hex? I'm going to give it three and a half out of five stars. I'm going to give it four stars. I really enjoyed this, but with a special reviewer's badge. I call this one the Wallet Disemboweler. Oh. It's far away! Over there! Um, Robot stating the obvious. He's running. And there she goes, the majestic Goliath, into the flames. All right, Hex, to help catch this lunatic, we're giving you access to the agency's super server. Now, what we have here is a 12-core, 36-bit, 18-teraflop SCSI card. Dual access, water-cooled, gigawatt, single press, a hyperdrive system with six ports of thermal exhaust and a single copper switch link. <laughs> I mean, do you even know what any of this stuff actually does? Uh, no. But can you guess the game for this week? Oh, well, yeah. It was Football Glory, or Total Football in parts of Europe. Released in 1994 for the Amiga and MS-DOS systems, it was a less than serious football game that featured streakers, hooligans and police to chase them all off the field. And it's our name the game as it was developed by Crow Team, the same developers behind this week's The Talos Principle. Next week on the show, it's all steam, smoke and werewolves in the Order 1886. Grey, where are you going? To finish what we started. And not too far removed from that steampunk inspired world, we also check out the top-down explorer, the Sunless Sea. And over on Spawn Point on ABC3 this weekend, we have a look at scrolls from the studio behind Minecraft, Mojang. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Large around. Scrolls is tough, man. Yeah. Like, I was like, oh, it's just like Hearthstone, but it's not. There's a whole lot more other stuff going on. Hearthstone makes me angry now. I installed it again recently. No! I played four matches. I'm like the lowest rank now. Lost them all. Uninstalled. <laughs>